And welcome back to another study of 40 Days in Prayer and Fasting, and we are in the Gospel of Matthew. We're in a very important chapter, and that is chapter 24, in which Jesus discusses his return, and most of it is covered in 24 and 25. It is known as the Olivet Discourse because it is taught at the Mount of Olives. Jesus has left the temple. He sort of had one last confrontation with the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, set out from the temple, and now he is sitting in a very intimate setting, it seems, with his disciples. And there is some discussion going on about when will these things take place? What is he talk? What are they asking Jesus? Well, they're asking him about a reference he made to the temple as he was leaving, talking about how not one stone would re remain upon another. And the disciples approach him, and I want to just go back to this question they ask. It's in verse 3. They say, when will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And we said yesterday that really there's more than one question here, although it seems to be phrased all at one time by his disciples. There is, when will this happen? Are they talking about... Uh, the destruction of the temple, more than likely they are. That's what he just made a reference about, talking about how not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. But then they also talk about what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Now, are these to be taken together, the sign of his coming and the end of the age? Well, there's definitely two questions here, so we want to approach it from that uh, position as we start our study today. I want to say good morning to some folks who are joining us already. Good morning to Forrest. Good morning to Helen. Good morning to Tamara, good morning to Donnie, good morning to Tony. So glad to have you uh, joining us already as we look at today's passage. Uh, I, again, I want to emphasize there's really two questions. What are, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus is going to talk about a great time of betrayal, deception, and being delivered up in, in, uh, to others and lives being taken by, uh, by others of his followers. So this is going to be a very difficult time. He says, as a matter of fact, in verse 21, For then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. So these are times to come in which there's going to be tremendous, uh, I guess, death, destruction, uh, poverty, I, I, I'm just thinking about everything, plague, just horrible times. So we're we are looking at with, with Jesus talking here. Hey, I want to say good morning to Don and Brenda. Good morning to Daryl and Darlene. He's gone over from verse 9 about persecution, like no time before being put to death. Um, we know that there's going to be hardship. There's going to be wickedness. There's going to be less love on the earth. So many bad things going on. And this is, like I said, known as the Great Tribulation. Now, a lot of people think the Great Tribulation will take place after an event, which Jesus talks about. When you go back to verse 15, he's talking about the abomination that causes desolation. This is a reference to something written in Daniel, in which this Antichrist, this individual that will come forward on the scene, probably from a political standpoint or initially, uh, he will raise himself up to be like God and will actually be in the temple or some representation of him in the temple. This is the abomination that Daniel's referring to, which causes desolation. There's going to be great tribulation upon the Jewish nation at that time and probably any who are sympathetic that are Gentiles that uh, reach out to the Jews in that time as well. So we set all of this up to talk about today's study. Remember that this is a major event. Jesus is talking about, of course, that uh, there is going to be death, destruction, there's going to be persecution, and then there's going to be this uh, abomination set up. Now, there's that other question, when will this happen? We also know that Jesus uh, could be making some reference to what's going to take place immediately in A.D. 70, whenever the Romans come in and set the temple on fire, <coughs> excuse me, there's some conflict <coughs> about whether the Romans did it or Roman allies did it, which would have been some of the Middle Eastern cultures that set it on fire. I don't want to get into all of that, but nevertheless, it was destroyed. And I want to sta uh, state something that I stated uh, wrongfully yesterday, and that was that there, this is still a portion of the second temple. I made it sound like this was a third temple. This is an expansion of the second temple that was built on after the Jews came back from Babylon. So I just wanted to make that cleared up from yesterday. 
I said it was actually not the same temple that was built. It's really an expansion that was uh, done by Herod the Great. So let's keep those things in mind as we look and start with today's study beginning with verse 30. So let's start with verse 30. Jesus is still talking about his return. And uh, let's, just, let's just start and we'll go back and we'll have to rehash some of this. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. All right. We said yesterday, this coming of Jesus is, not, is going to be overwhelming. It's going to be witnessed. It's going to be seen. This could not have happened just years ago because we did not have access uh, technologically like we do today to seeing so many things happen all over the world at one time. So this can be witnessed, I witnessed, uh, by many different means, but we will see Jesus coming. The people who remain on the earth will see Jesus coming with power and great glory, it says, in verse 30, you can read in Daniel uh, several references of one like the Son of Man coming. So we have this uh, to remind us of what Daniel said. I was looking it up today about the writings of Daniel and verse in chapter 7, excuse me, verses 13 through six, uh, 14 describe it. And uh, it's very parallel with what Jesus is talking about. It says this is kind of what Daniel was talking about. This is when I'm going to come back. I'll appear in, in heaven and all the peoples are going to witness it. There's going to be a lot of mourning when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Why? Because there's going to be judgment. There's also going to be the Jews who are, uh, who are going to acknowledge him for the first time as Messiah. They're going to be mournful because they, uh, this will be the first time that they've been able to do that. There's going to be Gentiles that are going to see him and behold him in all of his glory. Some are going to be caught off guard. They're not going to be ready for that. Some are going to recognize that they have loved ones, I'm sure, that are not uh, ready to, to meet him as well. Hey, I want to say good morning to Denise. Thank you for joining us today. What a wonderful crowd we've got. Let's look then at verse 31. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. So we see this collecting, this gathering of the souls of the people, uh, the individuals who are going to come with Jesus uh, and I say souls is, could be, you know, they could still be in flesh form. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that they're going to leave their bodies at this point. I'm just saying he's there's a gathering of the elect. One thing I want to focus on is that there's this shout or this trumpet call. Some uh, would say uh, messianic believers believe that this, some, some, not all, uh, could believe this is going to happen during the Feast of Trumpets because uh, it re refers to the great sounding of the trumpet, which is one of the great fall festivals in the Jewish year. It's very feasible that that could happen, that uh, it, it's a day of blowing, it's a day of the shofar. It happened whenever they went into battle. It's a battle cry. It's also a reminder that is uh, served up by the Jews that we are his people, that God uh, will hear the, sh the sounding of the shofar. So there is some connection there that's possible. Again, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but there are some that believe that is the case. Verse 32, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Just an easy reference of Jesus. Fig's very common in that, re in that region. Right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Okay, interesting word here. This generation, generation. What is he talking about? These people are dead and gone. They've been dead and gone, and Jesus hasn't come back. So obviously that's not specifically what he's talking about here. A couple of people have different viewpoints on this and opinions on this. One is that this generation shall not pass away, meaning that the Romans are going to invade Jerusalem in 70 A.D., and they're going to see this take place, the temple's destruction. They're going to see a battle against Jerusalem, many Jews killed, and basically the disenfranchise of the Jews altogether. The other position, which is a little more firmly held, is that when these things begin to happen, the generation that starts to see these great days of persecution begin and the setting up of the Antichrist and his kingdom shall not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. Okay, So that's probably a better translation of that but those are the two viewpoints. And another thing you're going to see here is that Jesus gives us references to Daniel. 
And he talks about here the reality of understanding the days and the times by witnessing the figs and understanding that you know summer is near, so you know it's just about time for this to happen. He gives a lot of detail, but then he's going to hit us with something here that's a little bit hard to reconcile, and I don't really think we can reconcile it fully. There's been great minds that have applied themselves to this, but you'll see what I'm talking about. Look at verse 36. Now, he's just told them that you understand the times by looking at the figs. And then verse 36, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, this seems to give us a vagueness. According to Daniel and those who study the these things and understand calendars, Daniel gives us an emphasis that there will be 1,290 days after the abomination which causes desolation is set up in the temple. Jesus has just referenced this in verse 15. So we tend to believe there will be 1,290 days after the establishment, which is three and a half years of the great tribulation. So many times you'll hear that phrase. After it's set up in the temple, three and a half years, and then Jesus will return. However, you have this reference that Jesus makes here that says, uh, no one knows the hour, no one knows the day, not even the Son, but only the Father. So there seems to be some vagueness in this reference that Jesus is making here. And then he goes on to talk about Noah, to emphasize this vagueness, and this reality that several are going to be caught off guard when he returns. Verse 37, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. So it sounds like there's, you know, life as usual, the routine as usual. And you think for a second, you think, how could it be life as usual and routine if there's been so much persecution, so many put to death, so many wars and rumors of war? Well, go back and think about the days of Noah. There was great wickedness on the earth, so much so that only one family followed the Lord and was saved out of that horrible time. There was great wickedness, and Jesus, or rather, I should say, the Father knew that he would wipe out all of humanity because of the terrible sin that he was witnessing. So we can still have the existence of horrible sin and life go on. Uh, there's just a sense of godliness, just tremendous worldliness. And so there is the routine, although it's greatly wicked, and certainly is going to be terribly uh, there, sh there will be great persecution, I should say, for anyone with faith in the day, right up until the end. Verse 39, and well, let me go back and say that the people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Could it be that so many of the faithful have been put to death? Uh, it's a possibility. There's no more teaching of the scriptures. It's a possibility. Now, look at verse 40. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Some scholars will say this is reference to what some call the rapture of the church, that there will be some taken and there will be some left. Perhaps that is why People will be caught off guard. Another uh, viewpoint that is pro-rapture or removal of the church prior to the Great Tribulation, uh, when they look at this, they like to reconcile the fact that Jesus is vague in this return because this rapture is going to take place and that's going to start the 1,290 days. All right? Some people believe it's going to happen before the three-and-a-half-year Great Tribulation. They believe it's going to happen three-and-a-half years before that. The fact is nobody completely knows, and Jesus wants us to be ready, and he's going to emphasize that here in a minute. Another thing, which is the opposite viewpoint, but just as honest and truthful, is that when you look at the reference here, it says in verse 38, For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, 
up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen, listen to this now, until the flood came and took them all away. So to be taken away in that context was a bad thing. So if you go on down to verse 40, two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. It doesn't sound like the one that's taken is a good thing, as some people believe the rapture is a taking out is a good thing. Jesus makes it sound like the taking is a bad thing as he makes the reference to Noah. So you have two different viewpoints. We, no one knows if the church will be taken out for sure. First Thessalonians, uh, Paul's writings seems to give, or uh, first, there's several references. I should, shouldn't quote certain ones because there are references particularly in the Thessalonian letters that Paul writes that talks about uh, what people would think would be a rapture out of the church. And then there are references that are also just as significant and give such an inference that the church will go through the great persecution. The fact is, neither side really knows. And so I take this approach. If there is a rapture and a taking out of the church, hey, I'm all for that. That's a great, great feeling, and it's a wonderful thought. But the thing that scares me is if there's not, we need to be ready to be persecuted for our beliefs and our faith and to recognize that there's not going to be a lot of people left on the earth at that time who still have faith. And so death destruction, ridicule, uh, persecution like we've never known before will face the church if we remain on the earth. So that, to me, is very frightening, and that needs to be said. Okay, let's continue with this. Jesus says, therefore, keep watch. And isn't that the key? Isn't that what we're saying? Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So keep in mind that reality is that we are to be prepared. Jesus emphasizes this throughout this entire chapter and this teaching. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, My master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an, at an hour he is not aware of. Okay, so we have the wicked one who is going to be caught off guard. You can make the argument, if you know the scriptures and you know it's 1,290 days, then the one who is obedient and doing what the master asks is going to continue until the second coming. But the ones who do not know and get caught by the surprise are wicked, and they're mistreating the fellow servants. I want you to take this and remember this today. The greatest lie Satan gives us, I read this, this is not my own, isn't often there is no God or there is no hell. The greatest lie that Satan tends to give us, particularly today, is there is no hurry. Jesus is saying, there is a hurry. It's time to be ready for his return. We always need to be ready. Verse 50, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect, does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. Verse 51, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't want to be caught napping. I don't want to be caught doing wicked things. I want to be caught doing the right things. I want to be ready. Notice that weeping and gnashing of teeth, it's a reference we're going to see later on in verse, oh, excuse me, in chapter 25. It was also seen a few chapters back in verse 22 when he talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth of those who are not present at the wedding supper of the Lamb. You read this, there are some questions left unanswered. But there's enough fact indicated here 
for us to realize the most important thing for all of us is to be ready. Whether he comes today, whether he comes all at once to gather his church, whether he takes his church out, whatever the situation might be, we need to be ready to go through the persecution that faces the world. And we need to be prepared to be right with him so that we can make it into that wedding supper, into that wedding banquet, because we don't want to be where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That cutting the mantu, that's sort of a, you think of being beaten or whipped, straps across the body is usually what that's a reference of. Uh, this is important teaching. You may want to get it in the hands of somebody you love today and share it on your Facebook page. Hey, listen, we are preaching, or excuse me, we're praying today about revival. And this is certainly a lesson which entices us to look at our own spiritual condition and let's seek revival in our personal lives. Let's seek revival in our churches as we go to the Lord in prayer today. Almighty God, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to look into your word. We praise you for it. We recognize the truth and the reality that you are coming again. And just as many were caught off guard when the rains came, and in the days of Noah when there was so much wickedness, we recognize that wickedness is coming which will never be equaled again. And we also recognize that many people are going to find death by persecution, by betrayal. And Father, if we claim to be followers and disciples of you, help us to be prepared to be betrayed, to be delivered into the hands of men, to not have mercy extended to us, to face death. And Father, we pray that whatever may come, that all of us may be ready to see you in all of your glory, to behold you when you return. Father, there's many people today that need to be revived, many churches today that meet, they need to be revived. We pray that you would help us assess our spiritual condition to not be one that listens to Satan when he whispers, there is no hurry. Let us not go through another minute of the day without recommitting and dedicating our lives to you, expressing our desire to be revived in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining me today. What a wonderful group. I hope, again, you'll share this with someone on your Facebook page. And uh, listen, I want to encourage you to continue to be with us. We are uh, just about a week and a half done with our 40 days of prayer and fasting study. I want to thank you for, for just making this a wonderful experience for not only myself, but for so many, and for sharing your encouragement with me and with others Hey, uh, if you missed one of them, you can always look up on our uh, YouTube page, Real Gold Hill, get caught up with the study. I hope it's been a blessing to you as it has to me. Hope you have a great day, everyone. Hope to see you tomorrow.